Psalm 122 begins with this exclamation, I was glad when they said to me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Written by King David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, some 1,000 years before the Lord Jesus said, I will build my church, nonetheless communicates the true and genuine heart of one who loves to be where God is, that is, in the temple of the living God, the uh, pillar and ground of the truth, where the Spirit of God dwells, the church, the temple, wherever the Spirit of God dwells, that's where the child of God longs to be. My name is Michael Chandler, and I'm pastor of the Victor Valley Bible Church in Victorville, California. And I invite you to join me for this Bible on Day broadcast on the subject of fellowship and the family of God. Timothy Dwight was the grandson of the Calvinist preacher Jonathan Edwards. Demonstrating a precocious spirit at a young age, he began reading the Bible at the age of four and learning Latin during grammar school, and at the age of 13 entered college at Yale, of which he later became president. He taught grammar school in New Haven at the age of 17 and became a tutor at Yale. Obtaining a preacher's license, he served as chaplain during the Revolutionary War with George Washington, and it is said that not only were Dwight's sermons an inspiration for the soldiers he served, but also his songs. Following the war, Dwight settled between 1778 and 1783 in Northampton, where he was a farmer, preacher, student, representative in the state legislature, and... um, Finally, as I said, in 1795, becoming president of Yale College. He not only served as president of the school, but also a professor of literature, oratory, theology, and college chaplain. Very busy life, no doubt. Credited with fostering a revival among the students through his sermons in the college chapel and revival that spread to other New England colleges a uh, leader in what historians refer to as the second great awakening of our nation. But he perhaps is best known for his legacy of hymns, including the one which is still published today in our celebration hymn, well, the one we use published by Word Publishing at our church, uh, the celebration hymnal. And it's called, I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord. There are five verses in our uh, edition of this hymn. I'm not familiar with other verses that uh, Dwight uh, may have left us. But I'd like for you to listen to these five verses of I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord. Then we're going to talk about what it is to be a member of the family of God and enjoy and appreciate the fellowship that God has provided for us with his people. I love thy kingdom, Lord, the house of thine abode, the church our blessed Redeemer saved with his own precious blood. I love thy church, O God, her walls before thee stand, dear as the apple of thine eye, engraven on thy hand. For her my tears shall fall, for her my prayers ascend, to her my cares and toils be given, till toils and cares shall end. Beyond my highest joy I prize her heavenly ways, her sweet communion, solemn vows, her hymns of love and praise. Sure as thy truth shall last, to Zion shall be given the brightest glories earth can yield, and brighter bliss of heaven. I've been pastor of our humble congregation for some 26 years now, and among the special delights of our church is their evident love for one another. We gather on the Lord's Day to read the Bible. As Paul instructed the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5.27, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle, that is 1 Thessalonians, be read to all the brethren and to the church which is in Laodicea, and the letter from, uh, to the Laodiceans also be read in the church of the Thessalonians. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13, the Apostle Paul says, I uh, want uh, you to devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture. We are to offer prayers to God as we do every Lord's Day. 
Paul writes in 1 Timothy 2 that of first importance, prayer, supplications, thanksgivings, and petitions be made on behalf of all men, all kinds of men, including kings and all who are in authority, that we Christians might lead quiet and peaceable lives in godliness and dignity. And so we pray to the God who desires all men to be saved. We also sing songs of our faith, like this one here I just mentioned. In Colossians 3.16, Paul describes the, uh, the church of, of that time gathering together and singing under the inspiration, I should say not the inspiration, but under the uh, filling of the Holy Spirit and with the Word of God dwelling in us richly, singing with one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. This is what we do with and to each other. We exchange greetings, as the Bible speaks of in 1 Thessalonians 5.26 and uh, 1 Peter 5.14, uh, to greet one another with a holy kiss, with a kiss of love. In other words, there is affection that is shared among the people of God. Handshaking and hugging and these kinds of things that go on during a greeting time at our church. We uh, give and receive offerings, as the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 9.7. Uh, God loves a cheerful giver. And uh, we don't give under compulsion, but willingly, as God has supplied for each of us. And then we participate in a lengthy sermon. Again, as 1 Timothy 4.13 says, to devote ourselves to the public reading of Scripture, to uh, exhortation, and to sound doctrine. The preaching of the Word follows. And in our case, we go very slowly, but steadily, through each book of the New Testament. Presently now, in our 11th month, teaching through the book of Hebrews. This is how we do church at our Victor Valley Bible Church in Victorville. Perhaps your congregation is similarly structured. And I hope that these kinds of priorities are true in your particular experience. But when I conclude with a benediction, this is the thing that fascinates me so much, and it's been this way for years. The most amazing thing takes place, and that is very simply, people stay. Lots of people stay. We enjoy a monthly potluck after our morning services. Uh, we call that a fellowship meal, which goes on for a couple of hours after church. But even on a so-called regular Sunday, many of us just simply hang out to talk about our Christian lives for over an hour or more. In other words, we like each other, and we find our fellowship time after church a necessary ingredient to a full week's recipe. What about you? What about you? Do you like church? I certainly hope so. Several weeks ago, in an article I entitled, Let's Do Church, I directed our thoughts to Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, where the Bible describes how the early church, it says, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Succinctly, Church life is about Bible study with one another. It's about sharing the things of God with one another. It's about eating meals with other Christians and all along talking to the Lord about everything. The phrase, breaking of bread, found later, uh, later rather in uh, Acts 2 verse 46, where it says breaking bread from house to house, certainly included the communion table, where Jesus' followers, by taking of the unleavened bread and the, and the juice or the wine, whatever your format may be, in our case we use grape juice, breaking of bread from house to house. This included, as I said, uh, taking communion with one another, uh, where we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26. That's what Christians do every time they remember the Lord's body and blood given for the price of their redemption. And we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This we do as a congregation, together proclaiming, preaching the death of our Savior for sin until he returns again. Now, breaking bread from house to house included this, yes, but also a love feast where the sense of community was freely expressed around a shared meal. But the reader's attention in Acts 2 and verse 42 is captured by the saying, continued steadfastly. To these matters of apostolic doctrine and affectionate devotion, the first Christians were soundly 
committed. To them, it was natural to meet. To them, it was not something forced upon an unbelieving heart, but it was the pleasure of divinely redeemed people. They needed church, like a thirsty man needs water. They needed church, like a hungry man needs food. They needed church, like a tired man needs rest. They needed church, like a lonely man needs company. They needed church, like a heaven-bound soul needs a taste of life to come in the presence of God and his saints. How desperate is your longing for fellowship with the people of God? One Sunday missed, do you feel like it just hasn't been a full week for you? Maybe you were sick or something or missed church because of some some illness or a, a unplanned inconvenience, I don't know, something, and you just felt this is not right. There's something missing. There's something very wrong about the week I've just lived because I haven't been in the house of the Lord. During the recent pandemic, as did other churches, we too closed our doors for a couple of months. We tried to make the best of, you know, Zoom life, live streaming some semblance of our fellowship. Well, we have since determined to never pull the power plug on our people again but allow our church members to come as they wish to our ever-open doors of Christian fellowship. Human beings need touching, and we need tangible expressions of love in heart-to-heart, face-to-face meetings. You know, I've read recently that nationally speaking, church attendance has declined since the COVID shutdown. Seemingly, professing Christians learn the convenience of doing church from the comfort of their living room. They argue, why risk the hassle? Well, Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, uh, classically quoted in such contexts as this, says that professing Christians of that day made it a habit of neglecting Christian fellowship. And the question is, well, well, why? I would suggest that it wasn't because they were afraid of catching a virus, but of associating with people who neither honor the religion of Rome nor their Jewish leaders who rejected Jesus' claims as Messiah. In other words, they feared persecution for their professed Christian faith, and so they neglected their Christian family. Do you consider your church like family? If you love Christ, you will love his people. You will want to be with them, and that at any cost. Romans 12 and verse 10 says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another. The Bible says that a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Do you know the adversities that your Christian brothers and sisters are experiencing? Are you, as we say, there for them? Do they know that you are there for them? Are you willing to give up for them? The Bible says that if we love God, whom we haven't seen, certainly we ought to be loving our brothers whom we have seen. Just read 1 John. It's full of that very important evidence of true, genuine Christian faith. Still, people who have given up on church altogether respond with a worn-out reply, saying, well, church members are too judgmental or hypocritical. Well, yeah, I suppose that's true. They're right, you know. Really, when you think about it, they're right. Judgmental, uh, hypocritical. Yeah, you're right. People who love Jesus Christ are much like their Savior. As it says in Psalm 45 and verse 7, describing the Messiah to come, uh, love righteousness and hate wickedness. That's right. Jesus Christ, who came in the flesh, God in a bod, fulfilled the ancient prophecy of Psalm 45, 7, and loves righteousness and hates wickedness. Echo back the exhortation. Yes, Christians do. Echo back the exhortation of Psalm 97 and verse 10. You who love the Lord hate evil. But Christians are also aware of their own need for divine cleansing. Asking the omniscient God, as David does in Psalm 139, 
to search out wickedness in our own hearts. Search me, O God. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there is in me any wicked way and lead me in the way everlasting. In fact, in the earlier verses, David says, I hate the wicked. I hate those who rise up against God. I loathe them who take God's name in vain. I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Then he says, Lord, search me. Know my heart. Maybe there's some wickedness in me I'm not really aware of, and I need to hate that too. Well, First uh, John 1, uh, 8 through 10 says that if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. If we say we have not sin, we make God a liar. But a Christian is one who is always confessing his sins and trusting that God is faithful to keep on cleansing him from sin and from all unrighteousness. No, true Christians aren't uh, hypocritical in that sense. We are aware of our own fallenness. But yes, we hate wickedness. And the, the, the lifestyles of our fellow Americans, we really don't approve of. And they might find us judgmental. But it's because <laughs> the way they're living is wrong and self-destructive. And we don't want that for them. But isn't there also judgmentalism and hypocrisy in business? Isn't there judgmentalism and hypocrisy in politics? Isn't there... Uh, judgmentalism and uh, hypocrisy and education, and yet we still conduct business for the profit of someone. We still vote for representatives. Uh, We still send our kids to school five days a week for hours on end, where they learn to make judgments. That's right. Our kids at school are taught to be judgmental. That is, to make judgments about right and wrong when it comes to English grammar, when it comes to physical science, when it comes to math, when it comes to music and art. I teach music at a local charter school here in town. I love being with my students, second grade through high school. And as the boys and girls put the bows up to their violin strings, I tell them, you're out of tune. When we pick up our guitar, we we set a tuner to the head of the guitar, we tune it on, we turn it on, and we tune six strings to an A440 standard. Anything less than that, sharp or flat to the standard pitch, is wrong, and we make a judgment. I tell my singers in choir, you are out of tune, you are wrong, let's fix the pitch. Even modesty and morality. Some of our schools here in town have a dress code. And if students are not uh, abiding by the dress code, well, they're brought into the office and given clothes that match and more appropriately, modestly fit the standards set by the school. No, it's not right for Jimmy to punch Tommy. That's a moral decision. I remember substitute teaching at a local elementary school here in town some years ago. And at the beginning of the day, the principal got on the intercom and led all the students in a pledge, a citizenship pledge, that had at its, at its root moral standards to abide by. Judgmentalism and hypocrisy are part of what it means to be a human being. And we've got to get used to it. Let me ask you, why was the New Testament written? Hmm? To correct over and critical judgmentalism and hypocrisy, even among professing Christians. Just read 1 Corinthians. Read uh, the book of uh, Galatians, where Paul tells the believers there, uh, be careful not to bite and devour one another. Isn't that something? And we're told over and over and over again to love one another. Christians need to be admonished, need to be encouraged, need to be warned. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 says that uh, we are to warn the unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with everybody, and see to it that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for ourselves and for all. Christians are not perfect, nor are you. 
If you aren't a believer in Jesus Christ, it's time to face reality and accept that Jesus Christ came into the world to save rebels who had rebelled against the high king of heaven. And he died for our rebellion, taking our sin upon himself that he might be the savior of men. Well, when one becomes a Christian, he is immediately joined to the family of God, isn't he? John 1.12 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. And you know, for all its foibles and imperfections, count me a member of God's household to love and from whom to receive love. If you claim to love the Lord, may I urge you to get to know his people now. With them, You and I will spend eternity worshiping the one who loved us and gave himself for us that we might be his forever. And by you, may the Lord bless your church, your fellowship, and the local expression of the family of God. For scripture memory, let me encourage you to hide away in your heart Psalm 16 and verse 3. Listen to the words of David again. In Psalm 16 and verse 3, As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. I hope that's uh, expressing our hearts today. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Psalm 16 and verse 3. Again, my name is Michael Chandler, pastor of the Victor Valley Bible Church where we worship uh, as the family of God at 16439 Hughes Road in Victorville, California, every Sunday morning at 1015. And our services are live streamed starting at about 11 o'clock. For more information, please visit our website at uh, victorvalleybiblechurch.org, or if you wish to email, my email address is bibletrom at gmail.com. Thank you for listening, and may God bless you as you live out the Bible in your day.